Good morning. There truly is nothing like getting together with 2,000 Wheat Knights in Edmond Chapel, so I'm very honored to be here this morning with you. Visiting Wheaton always feels like coming home, but this weekend it's official. As a student, I do have memories of homecoming. They mostly involve a sea of middle-aged couples taking up our booze at the stoop. <laughs> Little children monopolizing the ice cream machines at our new saga. And women knocking on our door at Graham House, excited to tour their old place, when all we wanted to do was print out a paper and get to the football game. So I apologize in advance on behalf of all the alumni on campus this weekend. <laughs> we know we get in your way and we mess things up a little bit, but we appreciate your indulgence and we promise to be gone in 48 hours. <laughs> Homecoming is a celebration of memories. It's a tribute to traditions. It's a time of thanksgiving for what was and a time of reflection on the journey since. But what we as alumni love most, and what always keeps us coming back, is the people who bring it all to life. The best part is always reconnecting with the friends with whom we spent perhaps the most important four years of our lives. I want to start this morning with a celebration of my Wheaton sisters. The Gravity Girls, they're right over there. We entered Wheaton in 1987, we graduated in 1991, and over the last 25 years, these women have faithfully served in a host of roles, in business, government, medicine, higher education, social work, in the church, and of course, in their families. One has brought health care to low-income women in the inner cities of Chicago and Denver, Another has transformed a dying church in Iowa into a hub for new immigrant families. One has spent decades supporting homeless young women as they transition into adulthood here in DuPage County. And another opens her home and family to a stream of international students looking for relationship in Washington, D.C. I wish you could sit with them all and hear their stories. They are wise and kind women, steady and humble, and I have been blessed and supported and inspired by them for almost 30 years. I'm blessed to call them lifelong friends. I hope they still call me friend after I share a couple pictures with you from our Wheaton years. <laughs> As you watch, please keep in mind that our pre-internet fashion resources were limited <laughs> and we didn't have cell phone cameras to be sure we struck the perfect pose. In fact, we had to go to SIPO to mail our film out, wait two weeks, and only then would know which one of us had her eyes closed in the picture. <laughs> but nonetheless, here's to Wheaton 1980-something. I hope you enjoy. Enjoy your laughs now because you'll be vintage soon before you know it too. <laughs> Trust me, it's actually not so bad. When I arrived on campus in 1987, besides the oversized sweaters and curling irons that you probably noticed, I brought with me some other baggage too, probably more than I realized at the time. As a high school student, I had lost my dad suddenly and I was still dealing with the aftermath as I started my freshman year at Wheaton. One Thursday morning, I said goodbye to him before I left for school. 
That afternoon, he was hospitalized with chest pains, and he died the next morning. I was the oldest of four children, and as you may imagine, the remainder of my high school years were bittersweet. My family grieved and worked to rebuild, and I struggled with, with anger and sadness that was beyond my ability to fix. As I started my time at Wheaton, the resentment I felt towards God held strong. It was certainly not my only reality. I served and learned and loved and enjoyed my experience thoroughly, but always with a piece of my heart that felt bitter. If I'm honest, being at Wheaton actually made the bitterness worse in a way. I had a hard time not comparing my broken family with those of the people around me who had parents at both ends of the dinner table, no financial worries, and seemingly carefree lives. I'm not sure I was even looking to deal with this, but one day God said it was time. I was speed reading through Romans, just checking off an assignment for a New Testament class when four verses in chapter 11 sprung off the page. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he should pay it back? For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. I have never known another moment when my heart was so instantly transformed. I realized immediately that in my hurt I had become arrogant and that that would prevent me from loving and serving God in the way I genuinely wanted to in my life. In that moment, God healed my pain and took away my bitterness. He gave me eyes to see his love and provision for me but also right perspective on who he is and who I am. I knew that the course of my faith would be better because of this new understanding, but I had no idea it would be my anchor in a hurricane 12 years later. Most of you are too young to remember September 11th, 2001 firsthand, but no doubt have seen images which captured the sickening attacks and the destruction that followed. It certainly was a day that ushered in a new era for our country and not a good one. And of course you know it was a day that ushered in a new era for my family too. In a moment, I became a pregnant single mother and widow of a national hero. And my children became fatherless. For a long time after, my days were a clash of surreal experiences and the normal routine of a young mother. Standing before a joint session of Congress one evening, reading Dr. Seuss stories to my sons the next taking children to Taco Bell for lunch before preschool, coming home to file life insurance claims in the afternoon, editing my memoir late into the evening to meet a publishing deadline, putting it aside when my daughter cried for her 2 a.m. feeding, an early morning limousine ride to a Today Show interview, a phone call on the way home from a little boy wondering if he should be Buzz or Woody for Halloween. It still feels like a dream. In my private time, I talked to Todd and I talked to Jesus. I told Todd what was happening and tried to assess how he would handle things if the roles were reversed. I cried over all that he would miss and in moments of black humor threatened to punch him the next time I saw him for leaving me in this chaos. To Jesus, my prayer was constant and simple, help me. I meant give me clarity, take care of us. And he did, consistently and boldly. God's provision was obvious to the point where I would often laugh 
at the inside joke we had as he sent just the right person at just the right time to meet the need or the question right in front of me. I can't pat myself on the back for the great faith I exercised during that time. I simply didn't have another choice. To tell you the truth, my basic attitude was, God, you did this and now you've got to figure it out. I'll try to listen and I'll work hard, but the results are on you. I'm not sure if that's good theology, but that's the deal I struck. <laughs> and I didn't just mean for a day or a year, I meant for as long as it, it took my children to grow up. Those early years brought heavy burdens of grief and decision and pain. But God provided, and the children he gave me brought hope and joy. All along, I knew I wouldn't battle with God over why he had allowed Todd to die or build a heart of bitterness, and that was a relief. He had already built a bedrock of trust in me for such a time as this, and that foundation held. I am a Wheaton grad, though, so I did have some questions, and I couldn't accept easy answers. Once the chaos died down and life took on its new normal, my questions became focused on what to make of the human condition. I believed absolutely that God creates each life for his sacred purpose. But in my private circle, and even more starkly in the big world, I couldn't deny that life seemed random, even cheap at times, and maybe not in an everything happens for a reason sort of way. Some of my Bible study even seemed to highlight the friction. I've always loved Isaiah 40. It's the origin of some of my special Romans verses. The beginning of the chapter foreshadows the Messiah who will come to reveal the glory of the Lord. The end inspires us to trust in God so we will have the strength to fly on wings like eagles. This is awesome imagery. It's perfect for Christmas time worship, devotional calendars, and a refresh on a bad day. The middle of the chapter feels a bit contradictory though. In verse six, Isaiah hears a voice say, shout. And he asks, what should I shout? The voice answers, shout that people are like grass that dies away. I've never read that on a calendar. <laughs> verse 11 rebounds though. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. I'm pretty sure I remember a picture like that in my 1975 Sunday school classroom. But then what about verse 22? It is God who sits above the earth. The people below must seem to him like grasshoppers. So which is it? Are we given strength to soar like eagles? Or are we destined to live and die unnoticed like blades of grass? Are we precious lambs or nameless grasshoppers? I was certainly not the first to ask these questions, but authentic answers mattered to me. I needed to know the truth to inform how to engage in my own life, how to pray, how to view and serve humanity, what to teach my children. As I suspect is true for many of you, my 21st century Christian experience had been filled with more lamb talk than grasshopper talk. One such sermon was given at my sister Holly's wedding. She got married about a year after Todd died, and as the pastor spoke, he reached out his hand to my brother-in-law Rob to demonstrate the way that God had reached out his own hand to Rob, and in it was the gift of my sister Holly. He said the same to Holly as a reminder of God's providence in their marriage. As I stood there in my bridesmaid's dress, I believed it to be true. I still believe it to be true. But as I looked at my infant daughter and my two squirmy boys in the front pew, I couldn't help but wonder how that imagery made any sense for us. I refrained from stopping the ceremony to ask a question. <laughs> but the clash in my, my, in my gut was jarring. How could I connect good teachings on gifts to dear lambs with grasshopper realities of suffering and loss? 
What did I need to learn about God's economy that would help me align better with his heart and purpose? I feel like I need to stop talking in the past tense now because I still don't have the answer. I still struggle to balance the contradiction and I suspect that I always will. At this point, it's no longer acutely personal, but it doesn't matter any less. Even the spaces where I wrote this talk raised the conflict. I prayed for inspiration and gathered thoughts during my serene morning walks through Cranberry, New Jersey, where I live. The sky turns from starlit to peachy dawn and the mist rises off of Brainerd Lake. But I also wrote at my desk 18 miles away in Trenton, staring out on a familiar streetscape where to the left a collection of homeless men spend their afternoons. To the right, students flow in and out of a makeshift high school. And across the street, people duck between cars to buy the drugs that own them. As I experience these two realities every day, I can only ask God, what do you want me to see? What do you see? Did those destitute men on the corner ever feel like lambs? Do you really have a Jeremiah 2911 plan for each of those fragile students? Is there redemption for those trapped addicts? When I hear the stories these worthy souls bring into our office every day, I'm really not sure. Human logic says no. How am I to respond? This is the only answer that I've come to. It's faith. Faith to believe that we humans are both sheep and grasshoppers, that we are loved and we are used. God does know every hair in our head and did knit us together in our mother's womb. And redemption is a personal story. But at the same time, the holiness and omniscience of God is simply otherworldly, and his system is entirely incomprehensible to me as a creation. It's in the more than we can ask or imagine territory, but still wholly certain and ultimately the very definition of good. This truthful balance keeps me from selfish assumptions that God follows my small agenda or from laissez-faire feelings of uselessness or hopelessness. Peace and gratitude flow from here. The tension, at least for me, needs constant tending, but I've actually grown to love it. Weaving the lamb and the grasshopper together has made the simple but difficult purpose of loving God and loving people clearer. His faithful revelations have better equipped me to trust him and to obey him, even in my feebleness. I can't begin to predict what the next 25 years will hold for you or for me or for any of my classmates celebrating our 25th reunion this weekend. There will surely be great joys and great sorrows, days of peace and days of turmoil, long lives and lives cut short, clear paths and murky journeys. In fact, most of us will know all of these extremes and all of us will be called to minister to people whose stories run the gamut. But we need not be anxious and we cannot be proud. We can only be confident in our certainty that we have given ourselves to a God whose promises are pure. Like silver refined in a furnace purified seven times over. A God who can tolerate our questions, who is strong in our weakness, and who inexplicably and eternally bridges the gap between human and divine with unfailing love. At age 32, I never expected to be choosing words from my husband's headstone. But when it came time, the decision wasn't hard. These are some of Todd's favorite words. And as I now see, a simple recipe for a hopeful, purposeful life. One that recognizes the integrity of the precious lamb and the humble grasshopper. Micah 6.8 says, He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? 
to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Thank you.